Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from interest.co.nz and welcome to another in our series of double shot interviews where we bring someone in who's got something to say about the economy and markets and property and all sorts of things and we grill them for a few minutes. Today we've got David McLeish. Welcome into interest.co.nz, David. Thank you. David is a senior portfolio manager at Fisher Funds and looks after Fisher's KiwiSaver Conservative Fund and the High Income Fund. David, so then what types of things are in those funds? Uh, they are purely fixed income, uh, so we invest, uh, we invest globally. We look at uh, corporate bonds, government bonds, bank debt um, from uh, really anywhere around the world, so we can look at emerging markets as well as developed markets, um, and we make investment decisions on a very global basis rather than being sort of stuck to one specific area uh, in the world, um, and that hopefully gives us uh, you know, better opportunities um, and better diversification. So how do you how have you learned how to do all this funds management across across the world? Yeah, uh, it's you know, I suppose over over the years, I've spent uh, spent the last ten years in, in the UK um, working for a number of the investment banks, uh, Goldman Sachs most recently, before that UBS and Morgan Stanley, uh, and uh, over those ten years, I spent uh, time in both trading roles, sales roles, and marketing roles, um, and uh, all of that time was was uh, focused on fixed income uh, and investing. Really, you know, uh, initially was in the UK and European markets all the way through into, into global most recently. So how do you keep on top of what's happening internationally from down here? It's very, very difficult. Um, uh, thankfully, I, I, I get to obviously travel a lot um, to be able to uh, get in front of companies, get in front of uh, you know, other investors, get in front of um, you know, uh, strategists, economists, etc. around the world. Uh, so I've actually just got back from the UK and uh, the US, uh, spent um, 12 days pretty whirlwind trip, but uh, included in that was some uh, some conferences, uh, some meeting with some of the investment banks, and meeting a whole bunch of, of corporations um, with regards to uh, you know potential investments for the funds. So, you know, there involves a lot of travel, um, but also you know really uh, you know it's a 24-hour job. Uh, you know, you really do have to keep your, your finger on the pulse at all times because so much is happening overnight these these days. It means a lot of late nights. That's right, and nothing uh, more interesting I think than what's happening in the bond market. Yeah. because um, we spend so much turmoil in all sorts of markets, currency markets, share markets, but a lot of people have piled into the bond markets, mm -hmm. in particular uh, US Treasuries. Mm -hmm. um, and we now see the US 30-year Treasury yield below 3%. Mm -hmm. I mean, how low can it go? Yeah, great question. Uh, and because people are piling into it, they obviously believe it can go a, a heck of a lot lower. Um, we are to some extent in that camp. Um, we're relatively cautious, um, cautious on the economy and on the uh, the prospects of of, uh, of global financial markets um, in that respect. And therefore, you know, if we uh, if, if we do see it, an even worsening of what's going on in Europe, uh, a slowing of other economies, a hard landing in China, all of these sorts of uh, concerns out there. Um, then then there's a very real chance that, that bond yields in some of these somewhat safe havens could go still quite some, some distance lower. It's extraordinary really because only a few weeks ago America's credit rating was downgraded and it's currently running inflation, depending on who you talk to, of 3 maybe 4%. Mm -hmm. Yet people are willing to put their money away or at least receive a yield of less than 3% mm. on a 30-year bond. How yes. does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. So effectively, you know, that means real yields are zero. Um, so, you know, the nominal yield less inflation, um, which is, you know, a pretty terrible return. Um, you're giving the, uh, the US government your money um, for effectively nothing because uh, you know, in a year's time you would have had 3% inflation uh, and 3% return, which means you got nothing. So uh, you know, that's, 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 a pretty, that, that's a pretty disastrous type of outcome that people are expecting. Um, and the way that we can rationalise that is, is, is twofold. Um, unfortunately, we're probably not through the absolute worst of what's going to happen within Europe, um, a restructuring or default in, in Greece and potentially some of the other peripheral nations. Um, also, we have some concerns about what's happening in China uh, and the, the, the prolific uh, credit expansion that's taken place there um, with, the, with the property boom. Um, and, you know, the US has got its own problems with, you know, very high debt to, de debt to GDP. So, um, you know, that's, 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 that's sort of the backdrop in which we feel as though we need to really safeguard our investors' money as best we possibly can. And unfortunately, you know, the yields aren't, aren't attractive, um, but it's a good place to know that you can sleep at night um, rather than, uh, you know, investing in some of the more risky 
uh, propositions out there. Does that mean that you think about um, hunting for yield by perhaps going into emerging markets debt or corporate debt? Well, we assess every single um, situation very much on its on its merits. Um, you know, rather than trying to fit a, a yield target into the fund, we look at what is really on offer and then make an assumption on 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 what is the best value out there at that particular time. Rather than thinking we need to get five, we need to get ten percent, whatever that figure is, um, uh, which you know hopefully gives us a little bit more of uh, you know a little bit more uh, overall vision on 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 really where the risks lie. Um, so you know. That's, I suppose, a pretty open-ended question. We do believe that some emerging markets still will weather the storm better than, than some of the developed markets, for sure. Um, that said, some of them may actually feel uh, a considerable amount of pain from here simply because they are exporting nations, and if the developed world is not buying their products, they may, um, you know, they may uh, uh, feel some pain too. So, um, you know, you have to be very, very specific with where you uh, with where you put your money at the moment. Um, and you know, unfortunately, you know, government bond yields where they are, um, there's still a very good chance they could go lower. The big debate for any bond investor is inflation versus deflation. Yeah. There's been an awful lot of talk in the last couple of years with a lot of money printing by central banks, very high commodity prices that. We're in for a period of inflation. Some people talk about hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, as we head into some sort of recession uh, in the developed world, people are talking about you know, very low inflation or deflation. What's your view? Inflation versus deflation? Uh, I'm in the deflation camp, um, and that sort of ties in with my view on government bonds, I guess, um, in that uh, you know, real yields are at zero. They may actually rise simply because inflation falls. Um, yes, the US is at 3.5% um, you know, three and three and uh, inflation, but unfortunately I think that is going to fall, um, which means that you know, therefore you know, your actual returns on government bonds may not be as bad as some people initially think. Um, so deflation I think is, is, is definitely the more likely uh, outcome. The reason that I say that is, you know, we saw through the global financial crisis through 07 and 09 um, that, uh, you know, the um, the world is very, very sensitive. Uh, well, commodity prices are very, very sensitive to the world's demand for them. Um, it's not this insatiable demand that will happen at any point in the cycle. Um, you know, you can see as soon as uh, you know the, the Chinese economy or, or some of the quicker growing economies start to tail off, their consumption of oil and, and and other commodities can fall very, very quickly. So we're concerned that that may actually start to start to build on itself. Um, the caution uh, feeds more caution. Um, People stop consuming, uh, and that will drive down, uh, you know, prices in the in the commodity space. Now, one idea that's going around the traps in the area of fixed income investing, in fact, the global economy, is that central banks and governments uh, will try to press down interest rates, short-term interest rates, by cutting them to zero, mm -hmm. and long-term interest rates by effectively printing money to mm -hmm. buy government bonds. Mm -hmm. It's described as the, the great re uh, repression mm -hmm. of interest rates. Mm -hmm. What does that mean if it's happening for bond investors? Uh, well, you know, in the very short term, it's actually kind of good for bond investors because simply if uh, you've got something like the Federal Reserve in the US or, uh, you know, the equivalent being the European Central Bank in Europe um, out there buying their own uh, government debt, uh, that drives down the yield and makes the prices rise. Um, so bond investors that are already invested in those bonds, you see an appreciation in the value of those bonds. So, you know, in the short term, that's, that's, that's pretty good, I guess, um, and we actually expect uh, you know the, the Bank of England uh, to announce um, very similar quantitative easing measures um, uh, in the next couple of weeks. To be honest, um, so you know we are invested in some of the UK uh, government bonds called gilts um, for that exact reason. So you know that does drive down um, prices really across the whole the whole curve or maturity spectrum of uh, of these uh, of these governments, and we think that's going to continue. But one part of the strategy is to drive down interest rates and then let inflation run at slightly higher than those interest rates. The idea being that if you've got inflation running a little bit higher than interest rates, you can in effect uh, uh, reduce the real value of that debt under, underneath it. Mm -hmm. And you can actually solve a problem of too much debt mm -hmm. by running inflation slightly higher than interest rates. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a worry for bond investors in the long run? Yeah, no, it is. Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, 
governments and, and, uh, and, and central bankers around the world probably don't think in that particular way um, and you know situations are very very different in different parts of the world where you know Japan you have uh, you know 97 percent of, of, of all uh, government bonds issued by the the Japanese government um, are held by by their local investors now if they were to inflate their way out of this problem they would be effectively causing um, you know some very large losses on their own um, uh, their own public um, so that really that, that situation there is, is really not palatable for, for Japan. It is probably a little bit more palatable for the likes of the US um, and some of the other developed uh, economies where um, you have a lot of foreigners own their, their, their government bonds. So you certainly can't roll that out, but I think what they're trying to do by driving down yields is simply reduce the cost of borrowing to make people go out there, and also the, obviously the cost of saving, making people go out there and spend, and also making people go out there and, and, and initiate new loans at very attractive um, low, low uh, interest rates. Um, and in return, then invest and spend and get the economy going again. You know that's uh, you know it's wishful thinking. Um, it may not uh, it may not occur, and I am uh, a little bit cautious about uh, that type of uh, mechanism being used. Um, but uh, you know that is that is I think the psyche behind why they're doing this. Now, just looking at the performance of the two funds that you were looking after, mm -hmm. you, you took them over at the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. um, the Kiwi Saver Conservative Fund for Fisher Funds. How's mm -hmm. that been going? Yeah, um, very well. Uh, like its name, uh, we are very conservatively focused, so we invest um, a minimum of 70% of the, the bond investments are in very high AA or AAA rated investments. So that really means we only really invest in government bonds um, for a very large proportion of that, and that has put us in some pretty good stead. Um, we do have a very small proportion which can be invested in high yield or unrated instruments and we have a small uh, investment in, in, in some equities as well from around the world. So uh, we've got a nicely diversified portfolio there but it's very, very conservatively focused and you know, that's obviously put us in some pretty good stead um, up, to, up to now. And the new fund that you're launching, tell us about what, what it invests in and, and what's the thinking there. Absolutely. The High Income Fund is a once again a, a global uh, bond fund. Uh, it will only invest in fixed income investments. It won't have any equities um, as opposed to the, the Conservative Fund, which has a small amount of those. And um, that will really be once again focused on uh, investors who uh, really want to safeguard their money. First of all, uh, it's really talking about preserving capital and generating a better level of income than what you'd Get from say the bank uh, on term deposit, which is you know currently four four and a half percent. So our sort of targets are in the six ish seven ish percent types of returns. So hopefully attractive enough to to um, to interest people to to, to give their, their money to us, um, but also along the way not take any undue uh, undue risks. Where can you find six to seven percent these days? Yeah, well, great question. I suppose actually there's, there's there's a really good starting point is is us New Zealanders have a very very good starting spot um, simply because um, we in New Zealand uh, have a higher interest rate environment than most of the rest of the developed world. So if I was to buy a US uh, dollar bond um, right now that had a yield of four um, percent, then if I did the uh, if, if I um, hedged the currency back to New Zealand dollars, so I stripped out all of our exposure there and just had the risk of that US denominated bond, that interest rate all of a sudden turns into 6% or a little over 6%. So we pick up an extra 2 to 2 and a quarter percent owning a US denominated bond um, by using our New Zealand dollars to do that. Now that's uh, you know that's a great advantage for New Zealanders, which I don't think people really truly appreciate. That investing globally for us not only opens up the uh, you know the realms of greater opportunity and better diversification, it also means hopefully better yields. Um, so you know I think that's uh, you know that's a it's sort of a um, an important starting point which we think you know we should um, you know we should be taking advantage of. Excellent. David McLeish there from Fisher Funds, the Senior Portfolio Manager who looks after the KiwiSaver Conservative and the High Income Fund. Thank you very much, David, for coming into interest.co.nz. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was another in our series of Double Shot Interviews.